Right, ladies and gentlemen, if we can be getting back, because I'm sure Councillor Perry wishes to talk about cricket. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, we now turn to the far more exciting and hopefully productive subject of cricket. <laughs> Which, uh, um, could someone tell Councillor Round the test score if they know it, because he's getting a bit fidgety. Right, we move on to, sorry, item 18. Cricket and Tennis Club, Frittenden Road, Staplehurst, Kent, Hope, and ask the officer to introduce the report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, as uh, members, members will be aware, this item was deferred from the meeting on the 6th of July to allow a copy of the uh, viability statement to be assessed. Um, that has now been done along with um, further information submitted by the applicant um, to officers uh, this afternoon. Um, the uh, results of that is that um, the, the, officer, the, the, the officer view is that um, that doesn't actually, the, the, um, whilst uh, the extra information is useful in terms of uh, the planning balance, um, it, is, it is the officer view that that doesn't um, tilt in, 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 in favour of approval. Um, the, the site is outside the Staplehurst uh, boundary. Uh, and, and it's considered co um, co 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 contrary to uh, adopted policies, um, emerging policies. Um, the, um, um, the, the actual design of the proposal is considered poor, with poor um, orientation, poor design, and the loss of trees and boundary hedging in this prominent location will be harmful to the character and appearance of the street scene. Thank you. You're an admirably succinct report. Um, I call upon Mr. Soans for, I hope that's the correct pronunciation. If it isn't, I apologise for the applicant, please. Is that working? Is that good? Okay. Chairman, members of the committee, good evening. Firstly, this application was validated on the 6th of July 2016, over a year ago, with the decision date of the 31st of August 2016. I will deal with the 6th of July and the 17th of August planning officers' reports on a dual basis, design and viability. The reports recommend refusal on grounds of poor layout, orientation, poor design, loss of trees and boundary hedging. The layout and orientation is congruous with the neighbouring properties on the east side of the A229, and the planning officer has failed to identify the design has been specifically created to match the typical historic vernacular of Staplehurst with hip tiled roof, bay windows and tile hung gables. So on these two main points, the grounds of refusal are incorrect and unsupported by fact. The reports are incorrect regarding the loss of trees and boundary hedging, as it will be fully hedged in native species, giving 75% increase on existing hedging, and the group of the ash trees shown in the photographs screening the dwellings from the main road will be retained as recommended by the arboriculturist. Most importantly, both planning officers' reports fail to report the commit to the committee that the applicants will remove two substantial structures, a large derelict pavilion with tiled roof and a large corrugated asbestos storage shed, see the heritage statement photographs, thus reducing the built form and bulking in the immediate area. Today's planning officers' report incorrectly states that the other options for funding have not been researched. But the viability statement clearly states that all conceivable opportunities have been researched and with an in-hand sum of only £5,000 per annum for repairs and the current poor condition of the clubhouse and the tennis courts requiring minimum £100,000 and £70,000 respectively, it's clear that the planning application is the only viable opportunity where sums like this can be generated. The planning officer's report incorrectly states 
there is no information on income. The viability statement states that the annual income of £40,000 is currently enough to run the club's day-to-day -day costs, but will not be enough when the volunteer groundsman, 71 years old, retires, creating a groundskeeping cost of £18,000 per annum. Thus, the need for improving facilities to attract more members and income. The viability statement states that the sum from the sale of the site in the region of £150,000 will result in match funding income of another £150,000 from the Lawn Tennis Association and English Cricket Board, which will reverse the decline in the clubhouse condition and the tennis court facilities and thus increase membership and subscriptions. Staplehurst is growing, and this sport asset, which has no government funding and relies solely on goodwill and volunteering of the community it supports, will dwindle and die if it's not allowed to capitalise on its own assets. In planning and design terms, it will be screened by hedges and trees, and there will be minimum harm to the adjacent areas. This harm is significantly outweighed by the potential negative impact on the local school in curriculum and after-school coaching, and the 400-plus current members of the local community, 50% of whom are under 18, which will be lost if the Saplehurst Cricket and Tennis Club declines and closes. The applicants and the club members respectfully ask the committee to approve this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sonex. Councillor Perry, you, you've had an entertaining evening, I hope, whilst waiting. It's now your turn. I wasn't sure whether to bring my cricket bat or my tennis racket, but at any rate. <laughs> the uh, cricket club and tennis club plays a vital role in our village. It provides an important facility for the young and has close connections um, to the local schools. In addition, it encourages healthy activities for all ages, something that Maston Borough Council and its own policies professes to support. For example, policy DM22 and DM23, which covers sports and recreational areas and sports venues. It's been said that policy DM1, DM3 and DM34 have all been quoted as reasons for refusals. I just do not accept this. Um, the, I, Design is very subjective, and there's really DM3, which is um, really concerned selling off a small parcel of land for just two semi-detached houses. We're not talking about a massive housing estate here. Um, it's surely not grounds for refusal. More importantly, policy PW2 of the Staplehurst Neighbourhood Plan is given as a reason for refusal. The impact of this small development upon the visual setting and landscape features of the site will be minimal, as will be the impact of traffic and noise. In addition, this application actually is in line with policy C5 of the Neighbourhood Plan, which highlights its need for enhanced sports and recreational facilities in the village. Turning to the viability report, this is capital investment. It's needed for the long-term viability of the club. We're talking about vital capital expenditure required to match funding, not general income to meet general revenue expenditure. I understand the projected annual income is in the region of 40K, which just about covers revenue expenditure, but would not cover the additional depreciation and interest charges for service debts of the level required to meet the level of investment needed. Therefore, the only realistic option is to sell off a small parcel of unused land to generate the funds desperately required for this very, very important facility in our village, and I can't emphasize that enough. Please approve this application, which will secure the future of this important facility for the residents of Staplehurst and the surrounding rural areas, because the club is well used outside the immediate vicinity of Staplehurst. This is an important facility. I cannot emphasize that enough. It is in line with the Staplehurst Neighbourhood Plan and the Emerging Local Plan, and in particular supports policies DM22 and DM23. Please, please support this for the residents of Staplehurst and for rural investment. Thank you, which is very, very much needed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Perry. I still think you should have put a croquet lawn in. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I take declarations of lobbying? I think we've all been lobbied. Uh, it should be noted that Councillor Bryce did send a 
letter around uh, setting, sorry, an email around setting out her views and apologises for not being able to attend in person this evening. Right, Councillor Prendergast. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we discussed this to death the last time it was here, and the only thing we were waiting for was the viability assessment. Um, I'm finding it really, really difficult, this one, because I, you know, we've got a £300,000 investment in Staplehurst, um, supporting our own policies, policies laid out in the MPPF, and we've got a recommendation for refusal. Um, the grounds are... You know, it's on the edge of a conservation area. Well, just a couple of months ago, we had some appalling fencing, which was right in the middle of the conservation area in Staplehurst, which was set for approval. I, it just does not make sense to me. So I, I think we should just cut to the chase on this one. And I'd like to move that we approve this post haste. I'd like to find a seconder, if I may please. And we get on, you know, the viability assessment makes sense to me. If it's on the edge of the conservation area, if there are heritage impacts, then we apply the public interest test, and I don't see an issue with this. Thank you. Um, if I could just suggest, um, even with uh, overturns where we're actually approving uh, as a, a recommendation to refuse, as opposed to the other way around, we, we need to, we still, I'm not objecting, I'm, I actually support what you're saying to a large extent, and we need to be very clear why we're doing it. So I would say um, something along the lines of, without going into saying the viability test as such, I would say, I think what you're saying is that the community benefit and, and the support for community facilities outweighs, in your view, um, the um, uh, damage to the, or harm to the um, built and, and uh, natural environment. Um, I'm not indicating whether I support that view or not at the moment, but I'm, I'm just saying I think that's what you're saying. Is that correct, Councillor Round there as well? Thank you very much. Councillor Round, that's seconded. Do you wish to speak now? I, I just want to say that I know what it's like in a rural community when you're trying to run a sports, sports club and you're also trying to get money and you're also trying to support young people. Um, and I know how desperate it is. So the, the application has my, not only my full support, but the situation they're in, that my sympathy. So that's why I will be seconding it. Thank you, that's very clear. Councillor Mumford, you indicated. Yeah, very quickly. I think uh, there are policies that we need to quote, those ones that develop sporting facilities within the local plan. We need to quote that it's in line with C5 um, of the neighbourhood plan. Um, the reason I will vote for the motion is we can't get a cricket club. Cricket clubs are dying all over the place. I was at Moat Cricket Ground, which is a big one, and the building is absolutely falling down. The stand is condemned. Um, if we've got a village, a parish council supporting it, a neighbourhood plan supporting it, I'm, but I would like to add one thing, that the landscape, I think we had problems with the landscape, and if I could ask Councillor Harwood whether he would get involved in the landscape of the site. But I will totally support this. The case officer is indicating that if it were to be approved, there would be need to be certain conditions, including a rigorous landscaping condition. Um, which, Anna, any other conditions that you're seeking, just for clarity at this point? I, I, I am going to take further debate, but let, I think this is important that we actually get um, it bottomed out what potential conditions could be applied if we granted consent. Um, at um, 6.19 of the, of the officer report, it does um, say that condition, if members were minded to approve, uh, a planning condition would, would be necessary to boost uh, biodiversity in the area. So that's the second. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Now, I 
Councillor Stockall, I think, was next. Then yes, then I'll be brief, uh, Chairman. Um, I just wonder whether, you know, the officers could tell if this would start a precedent. We could have very firm um, conditions on it. And uh, could we, this be called enabling development for that? Um, I mean, given that every village has got an I, area I like this. I, I think um, the reason I said what I said at the beginning was it would be very hard to say on the basis of the evidence submitted that it is actually quite falls within the definition of an enabling development. The argument for approving would be very much related to the policies that Councillor Mumford has just referred to. I'm not saying that's a slam dunk, but those would be the arguments in terms of supporting community facilities, sporting facilities, and social infrastructure policies within the local plan and the staple as neighbourhood plan. I think if we start going saying this is definitively enable, enabling development, we would need a much more robust financial argument. Um, Councillor Spooner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have considerable sympathy for the um, te tennis and, um, <coughs> and cricket club. And just looking at the site plan, I understand that the site is actually outside the confines of, of Staplehurst, but you could almost redraw those confines to actually include it as an infill plot. Um, you know, it's not going to do tremendous harm to the surrounding countryside. And also, going on from what Councillor Stockwell was saying, I cannot see how this prejudices or compromises any other land. It's not going to lead on to development creep. I mean, this is a one-off little infill plot, which I think can provide sufficient benefit to the uh, tennis club. And it's in line with our local plan policies to promote recreation and, uh, and enjoyment of the countryside. Okay. Um, Councillor Harwood, I think you indicated. Um, Thank you, Chairman. I mean, the, the, there is an issue here in that Staplehurst has taken an awful lot of housing recently and is putting pressure on the village and some of the landmarks are being lost. The apex of this site by the Cricket Club is unquestionably a softening green element of you know you're passing through Staplehurst when you see that, that apex, that nose of trees and, and, and shrubs that stick out. That this area is, is rammed with you know, hedge sparrows and so on, which are not all that common now within that hedgerow. And I am a little bit worried, I've got to say, I mean, I can see the way the vote is going, but I am a little bit worried by the drawings that we have had because they show the site subdivided down the middle. So there is a dotted line right to the apex of the site on the, where, where the um, Frittenden Road meets the Cranbrook Road. If we are to safeguard the landscaping in the long term and not have it tarmacked over and covered in four by fours within about six weeks of development, we need to unbolt the, um, the, the, the vegetated tip of that apex from the residential curtilage and make it structural landscaping for the scheme. I think if we have, the, if you like, the nose of this site is maintained with landscaping, we preserve the hedge, we preserve the trees, as the applicant has stated they're happy to do. I suggest that we do that out, outside of the curtilage. And then we can draw the line, and I think that there is then more surety about safeguarding the, the landscape setting. The other issue, which is an issue, is, is there, there is no certainty on what the longer um, that site boundary is going to be the one actually backing on to to, to the, um, the the land to the south, where, where we've got the red dotted line on the drawing. And I suggest that we need to ensure that there is some enclosure there with hedgerow on the side, so we don't get a close boarded fence or a, a red brick wall or something else which will detract from the landscape in that area. So that needs to be done. In, in terms of some of the other policies that we need to attach, this has to be quality, so I think we're going to need a materials palette so we actually know that the materials are the materials which are going to be reflecting the conservation area rather than some of the newer development, let's say, which is going on around here. 
Um, built into that, I, I suggest that we'll need a policy on, on the renewables, so to get some decent solar PV or something into it. We've already talked about the biodiversity things. I mean, essentially, the, the curtilage of the site is pretty much hard standing, so that would need to be some swift bricks or bat tiles or something built into the building. But I think with those safeguards, as long as they're built into the permission, I think we can get away with this. And because I think there is a danger here that there are lots of deserving causes that building four houses or whatever would help contribute towards it. But if we have every community space and amenity space and private um, uh, sports ground building and enabling development, we've got problems. So we need evidence why we can do it here. And we can do it here because we can build in the safeguards, which is that boundary buffer. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense, Councillor Harwood, and the officers are also making copious notes. Councillor Prendergast, Councillor Round, are you prepared to take on board those comments that Councillor Harwood made? Very good. That's wonderful. We're getting somewhere in the legal office. In. So if I just may, um, I just need some policies because I'd, I'd like, um, I think it's Tony who's dealing with it. Uh, Councillor Perry mentioned a whole list of them in, from the neighbourhood plan and from the uh, local plan. Can we possibly have those so the officer can just review them, please, uh, yeah. so, so that we can get that down? Because even though we're going against and we're approving, because going against officer recommendation, we've got to give a full reason for that. Also, part of the um, uh, res recommendation or the resolution should include, obviously, delegating the conditions to the officer. And just so I understand, uh, Councillor Howard, correctly, we're looking at I presume paragraph 6.19 in the officer's report, which I think might refer to your biodiversity swift brick things, yeah? Uh, hedgerows, um, materials, pallet, and conservation area, renewables. Those are the ones that I've kind of got. Do you, do, do you, want, to, do you want to give some slightly wider powers to the officers to consider other conditions if, if, if they should be deemed necessary, which are not considered here? Otherwise, what's going to happen is According to, to case law, if you grant subject to certain conditions, the only way, and if we need additional conditions, the only way we can do that is by coming back to committee. So do you want to give the officers, some, uh, in addition to those conditions, delegated authority to consider whether or not other appropriate conditions are required? I think that would be a wise precaution because of the, the overturn of a, of a policy and the situation we are. Right. Um, you okay with that, Councillor Hart? I, I, I mean, obviously, there are, there are all sorts of details that will need to be sorted out for a development on this scale, and that would need to be delegated to officers in the way that we, any residential permission, we have, there are all sorts of loose ends that need to be tied up. The one thing that was missed by the legal officer, I, I think, was this issue around ensuring that the, the structural landscaping on the, 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 the apex is outside of the residential curtilage and if that has to be a, a part, you know, looked after by the management committee or by the, the cricket club or, or whatever, but we need it, that needs to stay there forever. We cannot have that bought by a landowner, we can't have it and we might need to, I don't know if we need to remove, I don't know, whatever we need to do to ensure that we keep that landscaping on the tip of the apex, because I think that is the, the, the saving grace of the development. I, I, yes, I, th I, um, I think that that's fine. I think the mover and second of the motion are not in an agreement, as is Councillor Perry. I'm, um, I think I hate, I hate to lumber you with more work, Councillor Harwood, but I think given your expert knowledge that um, the, of, the officers should consult you on the landscaping and biodiversity details, if that is all right, and the local members, and the local members. Is that all right? Is that all right? Yeah. On, on all the draft conditions, local members yeah. and Councillor Harwood to be consulted on the draft conditions. That's fine. Yeah. If I can just... Uh, uh, sorry, Chairman. Uh, sorry, Tony. Uh, just, just, uh, the policies that I've got is C5 of the Neighbourhood Plan, PW2 of the Neighbourhood Plan, DM22 of the Local Plan, and DM23 of the Local Plan. Yes, I think that's correct. Yes. You're satisfied with those? Okay. 
Thank you, members. This makes a pleasant change from earlier in the evening. Right, we now have, I think, an agreed motion that I want to now put to the vote. All those in favour of the recommendation as amended. Thank goodness. That's unanimous. Congratulations. I look forward to seeing the uh, new expanded uh, and vibrant cricket and tennis club. And yeah, I still want a croquet lawn, but there you go. That's just me personally. <laughs> Right, we move on to the excitement, and I, do, and I say this um, with all due uh, seriousness, of Great Tong Farm, Great Tong Hickhorn. Right, before we proceed uh, to, to um, hopefully approve this application very quickly, I will just make, an, uh, I will say something for the record. Um, I won't go into the details, but a number of allegations of having an interest, a, a pecuniary interest, were made against a member of this committee by the applicant, yes, in relation to Great Tong Farm. Those allegations were investigated and by myself, by the Vice Chairman, and by legal and planning officers and were found to be entirely baseless. No member of this committee has a pecuniary or otherwise interest or has predetermined in relation to this application. So I make that absolutely clear for the public record. Okay. Now, we proceed to the application. It is at this moment in time a star, um, well, effectively a star item as we have no um, one here to visiting to speak against it. Originally, Oldham Parish Council did object, but the uh, proposal in question was recited, and Oldham Parish Council, um, having achieved a, a, a notable victory, um, in their view, withdraw that, withdrew their objection, which is why they're not here this evening, in case members were, were wondering. Um, is any member likely to want to speak to this application? No, in that case, oh, sorry, Councillor Prendergast, almost missed you there. <laughs> right. Sorry? Sorry? If a member wants to speak, it will have to be introduced formally and we'll have to do the report. Um, that's why I asked, because obviously with no member of the public here, if there isn't a member wishing to speak, then we just proceed to the vote. It does if you want to speak. In that case? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, now, one moment. Councillor... No, our, our procedure, okay. County Councillor, uh, Councillor Stockwell, as you know, is that if no member of the public, parish council, or anyone else has come to speak, the chairman asks members of the committee whether they wish to speak. If they don't, we proceed automatically to the vote. I believe that has been the process in Mason Borough Council for something like 35 years. Um, so, hence my approach, taking this approach. Now, a member has indicated that she wishes to speak, therefore the report will be introduced and we will have the appropriate discussion. That is what we have always done in this council and I'm not departing from policies, so, so I'm surprised that members are shaking their heads. Thank you, Chair. Um, this application is for a new um, agricultural building in a uh, farm complex um, on Tong Lane. Um, other nearby buildings are owned by the applicant and are in a variety of different uses, including craft, uh, craft workshops and a motor repair garage. Um, a public footpath um, crosses the site um, to Tong Lane as well. Um, this is the, uh, the proposed plan. The um, application involves um, the removal of existing buildings and um, silos, which are um, the, the, the um, outline shown on this plan uh, with the new building um, shown in bold um, and Tong Lane in the top um, right hand corner of the left hand corner um, of the um, image. Uh, in terms of the um, ex existing building, um, this is the, the building that would be removed. Uh, there's an access uh, through the building to the rear, uh, which can be seen in the uh, image of the back of the building. 
Um, these silos that um, are also vi uh, visible are, are going to be removed as well. Uh, this is a view from the north from the footpath with the silos visible. Uh, again, uh, another view from a similar location with the silos and the uh, uh, present building in the background. Um, in terms of um, elevations, um, it's a fairly, um, fairly uh, standard uh, farm building uh, with a shallow, shallow pitched roof. And um, internal layout drawings. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That's um, an admirably, admirably uh, brief description. Um, right. Council Prendergast, over to you. All right, Chairman. If it were well, to be a shorter meeting than I was anticipating, to be totally honest. <laughs> um, right. Um, I've got a few issues or a few questions about this that I haven't been able to, to um, gain any um, answers from the committee report uh, that we were looking at this evening. I'll start first with the first page, which shows the red line drawing there, which came up on the screen. The report that came to you three weeks ago for the amended plan is completely different two different red line drawings, which is something that I questioned back in November when I met <laughs> Mr. Jarman with, Mr. with Councillor Perry, who's sitting behind me, and have failed to get a straight answer on. So that's one. The committee report starts off on the first page saying the application site is located to the south side of the A229, I believe. Oh, the site is not viewable from the A229. Well, if it was the A229, I don't think I would be speaking on this application this evening because it's a few miles further towards Councillor Perry's territory. Um, the, there has been a whole set of issues with the consultation on this. Um, originally, the application was validated on the 5th of September last year. On the 27th of September, I was talking to the case officer at the time, and we discovered that we had consulted the applicant on this application. So rather than the neighboring properties, we had consulted Unit 5 at Great Tong Farm, Tong Farm, Headcorn. Great Tong Farm, Tong Farm, Headcorn, and the list went on and on and on. Um, no site notice was in place at the time. Subsequently, the planning officer went out, put a site notice up, and the um, consultation period was extended. But as far as I'm aware, having spoken to the officer on this, we didn't extend the consultation out to neighboring properties. I was told that this would requ require a land registry search and would be at an expense to the council, and I recall the sum of three pounds being mentioned to me. I don't know if this is correct or not, but that's what I was told. Um, the amended plans, which you were originally due to, to consider on the 27th, I know your minutes say for the meeting, I wasn't here, that the consultation was not complete. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the, com the consultation had not even begun. The amended plans were not on the planning portal and no consultation had taken place. Subsequently, it was me, it was actually I, that me, that pointed this out to planning officers. Subsequently, the, the amended plans went onto the planning portal and are now showing as having been there since the 27th of March. Now, in my mind, this is a little bit um, disingenuous because, you know, if they've gone up on the 27th, 7th of July, show it as being the 27th of July. Don't backdate things, um, especially when I've had previously in the past assurance from the chief exec that we do not backdate things on the planning portal. Um, having said that, the consultation is still not complete because this building 
which is a, a, a fairly large building, 33 by 27 by nearly 10 meters. So it's a sort of three-story building about the size of this town hall. It's, it's, it's a substantial building. Headquarter Parish Council here on the 7th of August say they have not been consulted on the amended application. So I don't know what we do about that. I'm concerned about the, um, I'm gonna move on to the planning considerations and the consultation responses. Um, the biodiversity officer has raised no objection subject to a great crested newt survey and a mitigation strategy being conditioned. And she wants this based on the existing survey data, which dates back to 2014. Um, by her own admission, she says this data is incomplete. Um, and we know from previous applications that both the Kent Wildlife Trust and the Kent Reptile and Amphibian Group raised serious objections to this because it was incomplete. No, we know that there are bats there, there are buzzards there, there are skylarks there by the applicant's own admission and nothing has been done. Um, what I'm also concerned about is what she has said in her report. She has said, from reviewing the aerial photos, the footprint of the proposed development site has limited potential to contain protected uh, notable species, but I'm presuming none of the oasts will be knocked down to create a road, etc. The oasts to which she is referring are actually the silos which are indeed being removed. So I have no confidence in what we've got from the biodiversity officer there. This committee report says that Southern Scotia gas networks have raised no objection. If you look at the planning portal, it actually says there are high pressure pipelines in the vicinity of the proposed work. Uh, we have sent a copy of your correspondence to our local engineer who will be in contact directly. In the meantime, SGN formally object to this planning application. I don't need to say any more on that one. Then we have, I, I'm sorry, this is a whole list of things that do not make sense on the committee report and I'm going to continue. Um, rural planning have said that a replacement building is necessary. On the 31st of July last uh, 2015, we, this council granted planning permission for a similarly large agricultural storage building at Tong Farm. At that time, Mr. Lloyd Hughes wanted some sort of viability assessment and questioned the need for an agricultural building. He hasn't sought any such justification um, in this instance. In February 2016, and I think Chairman, you witnessed this, this, this building that had been granted permission was full of white goods and not being used for agricultural purposes. And an enforcement notice was served and a retrospective planning application uh, was submitted. And at that time, the applicant made the following claim. Um, it is therefore not economically viable to use the building for agricultural purposes at this time. Yet just a few weeks later, this is in July 2016, just a few weeks later in August 2016, in came this application for this huge building. So in one breath they're saying that they don't need an agricultural building and it's not viable. And in the next breath, I personally don't have a view about this agricultural building. What I have a, a, a problem with is what we're getting um, as a response. Um, so this time, different story. They're saying that they're growing beans, wheat, rapeseed, oil, um, and the existing storage facilities are out of date, costly to run, et cetera, et cetera, and they need, and they need more, more stuff. And there I is somebody- I am sorry, Councillor Prendergast. No, I'm I've going got to, to finish. Ask you, no, I'm sorry, you're going to have to bring your remarks to a close. I've you have one, spoken for nearly 10 minutes. I've got one more thing to say on this. Um, so that's that. And the other thing that is causing me a huge amount of concern is what it says about heritage assets at Tong Farm. It says there's a small group of them to the east of it. Well, by my reckoning, there are seven heritage assets less than 100 yards away from this, this um, application site. And yet we have nothing, nothing at all from our conservation officer. Nothing at all. Yet it was this planning committee that refused an application at this site on heritage grounds last year. So I would have expected some sort of consistency in getting just something from the consul, uh, conservation officer, nothing. So I am just 
finding it really, I, I can't I'm see. I'm sorry, I, um, you, you're going to have to come to a halt I'm there. Coming to the, I'm coming to a close. No, you, you've closed now. I am closed. <laughs> I'm going to actually leave the room because I'm... You don't need to. No, I, you know what? There are other elements of this, um, the, some of the language that's been used by, about me by the applicant and officers, which we've seen in email form that I'm not happy with. So I think it's best if I leave the room. Councillor Prendergast, you do not have to leave the room. You have no prejudicial interest. You have not predetermined. And you have seen the intimidation and, uh, that I've suffered. And, well, it, it probably won't be affected by whether you leave the room or not. Um, it is your choice, but I would say, unless the legal officer is going to contradict me, that there is absolutely no reason you have to do so. I've asked you to bring your remarks to a close because it was a very long speech. And I do want Thank to hear, hear from the other ward member. I have no comments to make because on the basis of that, I think Shalina's made a case quite clear. Um, very briefly, members, um, there were clearly some procedural issues um, because that's why this application was not heard at the previous meeting when it was on the agenda and was rearranged for this meeting. Um, clearly, there was a problem with the consultation. Um, the, um, however, in terms of the Council's rules and the general legal requirements in relation to consultation of neighbouring properties. There is a bit of a difficulty here because although there are quite a lot of, um, shall we say, residents and people who live in the area, they all live in properties that are actually owned, almost all of them live in properties that are actually owned by the applicant because they are their agricultural workers, etc., etc. So by very definition, all of these buildings you see on this site map are effectively owned by the applicant. So you're going to be, by definition, consulting the applicant in a sense, although you are also consulting the people who live in those properties, if you see what I mean. So you are doing both. But it is actually, um, I am very familiar with this site. Um, the businesses here, like the, the Lotus Sports Car Company's um, business, um, again, again, that's owned. Um, there, there, have been, there are some possible issues in relation to, to the, the, the habitat report, um, and per, perhaps we, sh we should discuss that. But in, in, most, in terms of the viability, we would not, not necessarily seek a viability report for, for a standard agricultural business. Usually that sort where one is looking for a, a dwelling, uh, an agricultural dwelling, on a site for various purposes to support the business, and one is looking for a reason, a viability reason, why you need an agricultural labourer, a stockman, a security man, or someone to check the eggs in the chickens at five o'clock, have laid at five o'clock in the morning, whatever. This is, not, this is not that sort of business. So one wouldn't re necessarily seek a viability report. But I do think the questions have been raised about the habitat report, and we do need an answer on that before, before we decide whether or not to approve it. Um, I would say, finally, issues have been raised about conformity with previous planning applications. And yes, I think there have been some issues on this site. It is quite correct what Councillor Prendergast said about white goods being in a particular unit. But we do not turn down planning applications necessarily because of enforcement issues with other applications. It does mean we, we might need to look at inf further enforcement action in relation to those extant permissions, but that's not a ground for refusing that. So I think the, the question that remains is just to address the point about heritage, because that's been raised, and about the habitat and biodiversity reports, because I think that as they, those are va definitely valid planning considerations for this application we need to be sure about. I think both those, both those issues are dealt with um, in terms of the, the, the officer report, um, heritage at 6, 607 and, um, and the ecology at 610. Um, I think in terms of the sort of heritage impact, um, the, the, um, there are a collection of listed buildings um, to, the, to the south along Tong Lane. 
uh, but there, there are various farm buildings which actually block views of those, of those listed buildings from the application site. And, and also, this is, this is a replacement building. Um, there are buildings in application at the moment uh, and silos. And I think in, in, in some ways, um, this, this will actually um, smarten up that area because you're knocking down various silos and you're having a single building in that location. So if anything, if, if there is an impact on listed buildings, that, that is positive rather than negative. Um, the uh, biodiversity has been assessed by KCC. Obviously, they've... Um, made an error in terms of the, um, um, the actual silos, um, but they have noted the, 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 the present building on the site, um, and I think the, the, the only reason why um, this is a, a possible issue is because an area of um, hard standing has become um, overgrown. Um, they, they haven't, they haven't um, recommended refusal um, they've just um, said that the um, council need, needs to actually attach a, 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 a um, planning condition uh, to actually seek a uh, mitigation strategy. So they are they are happy with the with the with the principle. I'm sorry, I should have asked about the gas issue. It was raised. <laughs> Councillor Prendergast, yes, that's a very funny, Mr. Fitzpatrick. The Councillor Prendergast referred to an objection from the, the gas. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have the, the precise response um, here, uh, but I think in, in some way, I think um, the, the, the case officer has said that. Um, the, the um, gas net, net networks don't have an issue with the with, 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 with the application. So, okay, it's very clear now, Councillor Harwood. You were fractionally first. Thank you, Chairman. This is undoubtedly an intensification of the agricultural um, activity on the site. It's a much bigger building. It, it will lead to a kind of, a, you know, an upgrading of what they can do on the farm. Tong Farm has its impact softened by the, the big oak trees that are on the site frontage. All of those oak trees are all big and very old because for whatever reason, there is no regeneration of any vegetation underneath them. There are no smaller trees to take their place. Within a, I suggest, not very um, long time scale, we're potentially going to lose all of those big, over-mature boundary oaks. And when we do, this cluster of buildings will not be landscaped at all. It, it will have nothing to break it up. And I do wonder, because the site is all within a single ownership, whether we should not condition a landscaping scheme to provide just some sapling young oaks or allow some regeneration of the oaks within that tree group um, near the pond. Because otherwise, we're going to end up with those big buildings in a completely entirely open landscape in a very, um, you know, in a, in a very few years. So, you know, I, I just put that out there that I think it would be germane to this debate. Okay. Um, there is a condition on, but it could be made more specific. I think that's what you're suggesting, isn't it? I think it's specifically about the continuity of those oak trees. About um, amending the condition at the foot of page 295 for members' reference. So and I think the, I think Councillor Round is nodding and saying that's a good idea. Anything else on landscaping? While we? Councillor Stock. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, I haven't been lobbied on this, but I do know the farm uh, reasonably well. It's fairly near me. Um, it's a very established farm. Uh, generations of farmers uh, uh, have, have uh, been there. Um, but um, I looked at the papers, read the papers, and I mean, there's 12 no objections and one uh, very small objection. 
Um, so, really, I can't see the reasons for refusal here. I'm surrounded by buildings like this in a rural area, and that's the sort of thing they put up, and that's what they need. So, I would like to propose that we um, grant permission, if it hasn't already. Thank Take those who have indicated already, and then we move to a vote. Councillor Mumford. Uh, this is just to clear something up that um, Councillor Prentagast brought up. Um, and it's a difficult position, but we, we've got in paragraph 607 that to the heritage buildings, and there will always be heritage buildings on a, a farm site, an established farmer. It says less than substantial harm, which brings in paragraph 134. Um, just to support Councillor Prendergast, who decides on the harm cause? Surely it should be the conservation officer. I'm in full support of this building going up, but I'm just bringing that up. Who has decided it's less than substantial? Because if it's substantial, then we're looking at 133 um, procedurally, then we would have to balance the benefits. It, it um, w would be an assessment by the case officer, and I think that the reasoning behind that assessment is set out at, at 609 in terms of the, the, the other buildings within the, within the farm complex that screen uh, the new building from the listed buildings. I think, given, given the nature of the assessment, that's fine. It, it's not, it wasn't one that required a fine architectural assessment, as, as, which would need a conservation officer. Councillor Powell, then Ca Councillor Cox, and then we will finish. Ca Councillor Powell. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. I mean, I've, the, I haven't got a concern with the actual kind of the, the redevelopment or what's going to be kind of built there in whatever guise or form. Um, my concern was just listening to uh, Councillor Prendergast and speaking as a ward member, and I personally wasn't aware of half of the things that have gone on, and um, it sounded particularly nasty, to be quite honest. But I think as a, a committee here, I think we ought to support our fellow member and suggest that she does get a report to, I don't know how many questions she asked, there must be a, a good 10, 15 sensible questions, because there are obviously a lot of inadequacies within this report. There are even things that were mentioned by, I can only assume that what she said is truthful, um, that didn't happen. And we're looking at information that was being produced from a long time ago. So there's two separate things here. I haven't got a problem in principle with the, the application, but I think as a committee we should support her in what she's done. And I can see Councillor Ram raising his arm, who's probably going to say the same thing. Um, and uh, give her the answers, or this committee, the answers mm. that she deserves. I, I'm sure you're right, Councillor Powell, and the Vice Chairman and myself have been doing that process, but most of those were questions that could be asked, answered outside of the formal process, and that's what we've been doing. Uh, Councillor Cox. And Thank you very much. Um, I have actually, actually looked on this, uh, on our portal, and 5.05, .05, the report from SGN, clearly, very clearly says no response. Yet there's a whole page. And in the second line, it says we formally object due to what's running underneath this here. Now, as a committee, if we say this is absolutely fine because we are shown the information on our papers and we don't go through as... Councillor Prendergast has and looked at underneath every rock of which there were 44 documents to go through then someone could have gone in there with a digger blown themselves sky high and I would have felt very bad that we passed it because there was an objection not a little bit of an objection a lot I'm sorry I think this is quite bad that something's been upturned here and there's there are a lot of discrepancies and I'm glad that this is being looked into. Thank you. Councillor Round, and you, you get the last word. I think some very relevant points have been said, particularly by Councillor Cox and Councillor Powell recently. I think it is very pertinent that Councillor Prendergast gets some sufficient answers. 
but having been involved in this particular application for some time now, and knowing many of the ins and outs, I just want to make it clear to all members present that the current case officer, Mr. Ryan over there, actually inherited it very lately. If you're looking for a scapegoat, don't look over there. <laughs> I, I don't see why we couldn't add a condition to, to, to ensure that investiga appropriate investigation of any necessary mitigation in relation to the gas supply. No, no, just to see, to see whether there is an issue and what needs to be done about it. Yeah, because we do it with um, water and other utilities. We can, we can have a condition to, to, in, to investigate whether any, can any works can be required. Yes. And so we have a delegation to, to investigate that issue and take any appropriate action with SGM. Yeah. It may be that a condition is not appropriate, but at least let, let the delegation be given so that the officer can investigate and identify whether or not there is a, a, a way that it can be dealt with. Okay, with that late amendment, uh, I think everyone's had their say. I, I will put that um, proposal that we grant planning consent with that amended condition. Um, and the one that Councillor Harwood mentioned earlier in relation to the specific references to Sapling Oaks um, to the vote. All those in favour? That's everyone. Um, I'll be, thank you very much, members. We move rapidly on, or not as the case may be, to uh, 13 Gordon Cloak Court Lose, sorry, which um, again is. Um, an application which um, seems to be a fairly low controversy and there's no one here to speak to it. So I ask if anyone is likely to wish to speak to this application. I think you're saying yes, Karen. I'm Not necessarily. I, I'm just seeking a clarification um, that there is a reference there, our normal standard approach, we build in the niches for wildlife in line with, with the MPPF. But I am picking up from the paper, though it's not explicit, that they're talking about sticking some bird boxes on a fence or on a tree. And I'm afraid that is not really sustainable and not in the spirit of the MPPF. So as long as I can have um, some reassurance that we're talking about bat and bird boxes within the fabric of the building, I'm happy to, that we don't introduce it. Right, well, I think that's a fairly legitimate request. All, and really everyone cool. agrees with that, don't they? Right. Yeah. Okay, on that basis, I formally move the recommendation on the papers as subtly amended. All those in favour? Oh, oh, sorry, that's a very good point, Martin. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, I must be getting old. Thank, good night, Councillor <laughs> Perry. Yeah, um, there wasn't any on that, I know. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, could I say that I wasn't lobbied on that one? The reason I didn't ask for it, the reason I didn't ask for it was I was aware that there wasn't any. But I should. Um, but you are quite right. The fact that I knew there wasn't didn't mean I shouldn't have asked. I, so I should have done. Very good point. I <laughs> <laughs> told you. <laughs> Right, we move on to the ever popular Harwich. Um, this application is here because the applicant is a, well, both applicants, shall we say, are members of the Borough Council, uh, Tom and Janetta Sams. That is the only reason the application is on the agenda. Um, because of the because of who they are, I would ask for a quick introduction because protocol says that borough council applications should be introduced, however briefly. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, this is for um, the removal of um, the garage and uh, front extension of this uh, two-storey property and um, a new single-storey front extension and um, cladding to the first floor um, of this building. Um, officer recommendation is to approve subject to planning conditions. Thank you. 
Uh, Councillor Powell, you're not exactly the local member, but it is in your neck of the woods. Do you no. have any comments? No, I've got, sorry, I've got no comments at all. I, was, uh, I put my hand up wrongly about a different application, which is going to be heard next week. But uh, I, I would like to... Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it, 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 it was the running from the car park. It doesn't do me any good these days. No, I'd just like to recommend that we uh, approve as per the papers. Thank you very much. Now, we have no urgent updates. We have no declarations of lobbying, so I will move straight to seconding that, that motion for approval as per the papers. All those in favour? Thank you very much, members. All right, before we uh, adjourn to recover our nerves in whatever local hostelry we can find. Um, we, we do have a one appeal decision on the yep. paper, on pay uh, right at the end of the agenda. It was not a, it was not a great result in Councillor Harwood's ward, uh, Calder Road. Um, did you want to ask any questions about that, Councillor Harwood or Councillor Hasty? Or, uh, I've read the paperwork and I think the inspector just had a difference of opinion and uh, I'm, I'm okay. These things happen in the best order of worlds. Right, thank you very much. Um, members, it's not been the easiest of meetings. May I thank you for the uh, cordial manner in which the meeting was conducted given the uh, difficult nature of the, the discussions we'd had and I want to thank our officers for dealing uh, with, with a difficult meeting with, with professionalism. Councillor Cox. Uh, Mr Chairman, may I ask where we are with the situation about the screens? Because the this what? is oh, an yes, awful lot of money screens, yeah. that we're spending on full colour. Let's not spend it and just get the right system put in around the edge of the whole building and get it done properly. Can we move that formally from this committee, please? Get it done. I, I was holding out for the sliding roof. But, um, <laughs> all right. A, a, any other? Um, I'm sure I saw someone else indicate about something. Oh, was Councillor Round? All oh, me. Am I back on? Right. You know, I, I just wanted to say it has been difficult, as Chair, Chair said. I just wanted to say that as Vice Chair and we all appreciate how difficult it is for all members and all officers. And I think the one thing we all must do at the end of the day is still look for ways forward. And I believe that whatever our differences, we will all still look for ways forward. And I thank the officers and all members for their patience and tolerance. Have a nice evening. I'm really lucky you might get the end of the cricket. <laughs>